Welcome to Everlasting Life Ministries. I am your program host, Michelle Vinal, and this is our second uh, lesson that we're going to be uh, teaching on today. We're going to be talking uh, on Matthew. We're going to be ministering on Matthew, the 17th chapter, and we're going to be talking about a scripture that I think many of you are pretty familiar with, and uh, we're going to be reading from Matthew, the 17th chapter, the 24th verse to the uh, 27th verse. Um, The title of this particular lesson is The Image You Bear is the Currency of What You Produce. Okay, so that's the image that you bear is the currency of what you produce. So turn with me, if you will, to Matthew. Again, the 24th chapter. I'm going to start at the 24th verse. Uh, Here Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's talking about the tribute that they have to pay or the taxes. And many of us, I'm sure, can identify with that. It says, and they were come to Capernaum and they received tribute money. And they received tribute money, came to Pete. They that received tribute money, excuse me, came to Peter and said, does not your master pay tribute? He saith yes when he was coming to the house. Jesus prevented him saying, what thinkest thou, Simon, of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Now, it's really important when you read the scripture, sometimes you have to slow down. It's like eating a good meal. You have to slow down, but you want to make sure that you meditate on the word of God. Allow the Holy Spirit to give you the capacity to extract and pull apart the word of God so that you can get the fullness of the meaning. And a lot of times there are various levels of power that God is imparting and transferring to you as you read the word of God. Now here he says to him, he's asking him a question. What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith unto him, of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, then are their children free? Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast a hook and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. Then take and give unto them for me and thee. Now, this is really powerful because what what he's going to do is the Lord Jesus Christ uses this opportunity to teach. Remember that the Lord is, many times you'll find in scripture, the Lord Jesus Christ is referred to by the disciples as a rabbi which means teacher. So he's always teaching. He's always imparting. He's always building in them the precept upon precept of the principles of the kingdom of God so that they can understand how the kingdom of God functions, the functionality of the kingdom of God. Now, there's a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And so I want you to understand that when you're dealing with the kingdom of heaven, you're dealing with the invisible realm or the realm of the spirit. But when you're dealing with the kingdom of God, you're dealing with the death the the realm of what's taking place within your soul and wherein you're yielding your mind and your heart to God's dominion. The word kingdom is composed of the two words king and D-O-M, which is short for dominion. So when God talks about the kingdom of God, he's talking about the place where a person and or people are submitted to his dominion. You can see see angels that are moving and warring in the spirit, but the angels uh, that are in the kingdom of God are different than the angels that are in the kingdom of heaven because the kingdom of heaven is the heavenly or spiritual realm, but there are two different kingdoms that are functioning and fighting and warring on behalf of the souls of humanity. And so it's extremely important to understand that when you're talking about a kingdom and the kingdom of God, it is a place where you have given God total sovereignty and total dominion over your mind and over your will, which is your choices and your decisions and what you do and your heart is the seat of that. Your heart is the seat of your soul. So your heart is where all the emotions flow out. That's where everything is born and birthed out of. That's why the Bible says, guard your heart for out of it flows the issues of life. It says that when you speak out of the abundance of a man's heart, does a person or a man or a woman speak? And what you speak has life in it. So it's important to guard your heart. It's important to have your heart 
uh, submit it under God's dominion and sovereignty so that your heart can be seen and bear the image of Jesus Christ so that he knows when he looks at your soul and he sees your heart, he sees his image, he knows that, that belongs to me. That's a part of the kingdom of God. Amen. And so he's giving us a revelation here. The fish is indicative of a type of a person's soul. What does he say to the disciples? He says, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Why fishers of men? Why does he use that description? Because a fish is very slippery. It's very difficult to catch. Many times when you're winning souls, it's very difficult. A soul can look like they're coming into that net of salvation and suddenly slip out. So you never know, but there is a place where the net goes down and the power of God shows up. And when you pull the net up, it's filled with the fish. It's filled with the souls of men. It's filled with the souls of humanity. It's filled with those souls that you are bringing into where the kingdom of God, a place where they are submitted to the dominion of God. And the beauty of that, glory to God, a lot of times what people don't understand is there are a lot of demonic things that perpetrate, or if you will, a falsehood of what principles are in the kingdom of God and in the word of God. Jesus talks about letting down your net. He talks about being fishers of men. When you look at the internet, we see that it's a net or a trap for souls, for humanity. We see a lot of things on social media that come to destroy people sometimes. And some things are good and some things are bad. So what makes the differentiation is not the fact that there is a net, but it's a fact of what you're utilizing, what you're bringing people to the knowledge of. What are you utilizing? Using to catch them, to catch their attention? Are you trying to bring them into the kingdom of God or are you bringing them into a place that is contrary to God? And so always be aware that the adversary has a counterfeit for everything that God has presented and he understands the principles of the spiritual realm and the realm of heaven. And so here, we're going to go a little further down. Uh, and it is really important because he says, at the same time, the disciples uh, came unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Pay close attention to that, in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halted or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Now, it says, and if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Um, a lot of times we see these things, and there's a reason why I'm going over that, because he talked about it's better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck uh, and have you cast into the sea. Also, he talks in another scripture about that same incident with the fish, and he says, whose image is on the coin that was brought out of the fish's mouth. Now, the image that was on the coin was Caesar's image because they were on Caesar's land. Within any district of authority or power, whatever organization or governing authority that you are dwelling within a particular territory of, you are going to owe tribute to them. In other words, if they're governing the land, if they have police officers that go out to keep the peace in the land, if they're the ones that are managing, and keeping everything in order, then they're owed a tribute. Amen. And in the same way, if God is the one that is governing our soul and our soul belongs to the kingdom of God, the place where he has dominion, we owe him a tribute. The tribute that God is looking for is his image on the inside of our soul. He's saying this because what he's saying is when you're on Caesar's land, you give him what you owe him. And so the money that you're giving him that you make from profit, from, you know, tilling the land, from farming the land, from selling on the land, from 
whatever you do within that realm of territorial authority that belongs to him, you have to yield to him back a profit, something profitable that possesses his image so that he, you can see you're a part of that country or you're a part of that land because we're a part of the kingdom of God. What we yield out of our soul, the fish represents the soul, the mind, the will, and the, the emotions, the heart, what we yield out of our heart, what we yield out of our mouth, what you speak, what comes out of your mouth is what's in your soul, right? That's why the Bible says out of the abundance of a heart, a man speaketh. So what's in my soul, what's in my heart is going to come out of my mouth. And what comes out of my mouth should bear the image of Jesus Christ. It should be bear the image of God. Why? Because I belong to God. My soul belongs to God. So if my soul belongs to the kingdom of God, if I'm a citizen of heaven, then what I speak should have the profitability of the currency of heaven. It should have the currency of that place where God reigns and he rules. When I speak, when I'm talking with my neighbors or talking with people, I should have the image of God coming out of my words. What I speak should reflect the nature of Christ. It should reflect his goodness, his kindness, his temperance, his mercy, his joy, his peace. Amen. Why? Because I am a citizen of the kingdom of God. I am a, 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 a citizen. I dwell in a place of the territory in the spirit that belongs to God. And so because I am submitted to his dominion, to his authority, to his power, and I belong in that realm in the spirit that belongs to God, then when I speak and open my mouth, the currency that comes out of my mouth should bear his image. Amen. That's why I said the image that we bear is the currency of who we are. And now here we see God goes on and he talks about a little child. And the reason why he talks about the little child is because a child believes anything initially. A child comes into the earth and they're vulnerable. A child comes into the earth and they don't know anything but what you tell them. And so the scripture tells us in the word of God that that's the greatest. But the difference is he wants us to believe him. God wants us to have the disposition of a child, to have childlike faith that whatever he tells us, we simply believe him. We don't fear. We don't question. See, when there's fear, then there's room for doubt. And when there's room for doubt, there's room for rebellion and disobedience. But when we completely believe what it is that he's telling us, when we completely believe the word of God, there is no fear in us. And so we have childlike faith, which is faith that is immutable. There is nothing that can withstand that type of faith because it's complete. Why is it complete? Because it's perfect. Because children love their parents. Initially, when children are small, uh, they just automatically have a love for their, for their family, for their mother and for their father. And they believe them and they trust them. And that's how God wants us to function. He wants the functionality of our relationship and our intimacy with him to be such as a small child. The awesome thing about God is that even though you might have been born in a family where you could have had an alcoholic mother or father, an abusive mother or father, maybe you even went through something as horrible as sexual assault or abuse, but the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ contains a restitution capacity, the capacity to restitute or give you back what was stolen from you. When you become born again by the spirit of God, you're introduced to your parent, the parent that breathed you into existence, that parent that knew you before you were physically born in the earth realm. You were a gift to your parents. I don't care if your parents were married or unmarried. You were a gift to both of them. Whenever male and female come together, the image of God is reflected and life can be produced. And out of that life, that comes through the sexual union and the oneness of both male and female produces the life of God and the life of God is you. God, you came out of him. See, and so when male and female come together reflecting the image of God through the intimacy of the sexual relation, you find that children are born and that is still a gift in the earth. Every child is a gift in the earth. They are a gift to their parents. Whether the parents acknowledge it or not, maybe you don't feel like a gift. Maybe you have a, in dealt with the spirit of rejection all your life. In the name of Jesus Christ, at the sound of my voice, I command every spirit of rejection to detach from you, to detach from your mind and to detach from your heart and to detach from your spiritual ears so that you will not hear what the enemy is telling you about yourself any longer and you will not be robbed of your identity. You came from God. 
You came from God. He breathed you into existence from the spiritual realm, and he caused you to be conceived in your mother's womb. He knew you. The Bible tells us that in Jeremiah 1, 5, he said, before I, I formed you, Jeremiah, I knew you. I knew you. How does he know you? Because you came out of him. He knew you. You were searched all together from, from the very beginning. He knew you before you were formed physically in your mother's womb because you begin in the spirit and then you manifest in the fleshly realm. And once you hear the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, you become quickened, if you will, or your spirit that, you, that came from God becomes quickened or made alive in the earth realm. And then you begin to understand and walk with God and understand that you have a parent and that parent is God the heavenly father and he begins to nurture you he begins to give you the love that maybe you didn't get growing up in your household he begins to fulfill and close in the gaps all the places that are empty the places of failure that occur within our family life because of sin and because of being uh, uh, in a place of fallen mankind he fills those gaps in and he's able to restitute or go back and restore and put back in what we lost or what we didn't get. And he gives you that ability to have a relationship with someone that loves you unconditionally. How does he love you unconditionally? It's the same way you love your children or you have love for someone in your family unconditionally because you love them, because you choose to love them. And so he loves you unconditionally and he loves you into a place of wholeness and into a place of healing. When God begins to bring that love and manifest that love to you, you begin to learn who you are. You don't know who you are. A lot of times we have negative stigmas and labels that people attach to our minds. You know, from the time we're small children, you might have a teacher that says, oh, you're so disorganized or you're this or you're that. I've been guilty of speaking negative words over my child's life, Cody Michael. And I had to go back and I had to say, Cody, I'm so sorry, you know, that I spoke those words. And I really, truly was sorry. But I had the condition of sin in my soul, even though I was born again and spirit filled, I wasn't perfect. Perfect, and I needed deliverance in some areas. And so I had to go back and correct some things. Still come sometimes have to go back and say, hey, you know, I remember something that happened and I wish I would have handled it this way because I don't want him to make those mistakes with his son, you know, which is my grandson growing up. And and it's, it's good to be honest and to be in cr groups of Christians, you know, around different Christians where you can talk about these things and talk about different scenarios and situations where you could have maybe done it better or what the Holy Spirit would have had you do. Do, to be led by the Holy Ghost, to be led by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God never leaves you. The Bible says that once you get saved and you become born again and you, and you get filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost says, in the scriptures, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I'll be with you always, even to the end of time. Some of you are, have fallen away from God. You've backslidden, but the Holy Spirit has still been there with you. He's still been talking to you. He's still been telling you, hey, come on, let's get back on track. I want you to come on back. Maybe you were hurt in church circles. Let me tell you something. You can be hurt in church circles. You can also be hurt in worldly circles. Hurt is going to come. The scripture tells us here that offenses come. I want to read that one more time because we have to learn how to overcome them through the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, uh, you know, offenses come. He says, woe unto the world because of offenses. And this is in Matthew, the 18th chapter and the seventh verse. Woe unto the world. In other words, there's some, there's a judgment that's coming to through the world because of offenses. But it must needs be that offenses come. In other words, it's a part of life that people are going to offend you. I know we don't want to receive that. We want just this candy-colored, perfect world, cotton candy filled with everything we want, and nothing bad ever happens. But that's just not the reality. Reality. We live in the earth and because of sin, sin has caused so many terrible things to take place within the earth realm. Life is still beautiful and there's still wonderful things we can experience, but there are going to be times where we do have challenges. And in those challenges, we will experience some offenses and people saying things and doing things to us that hurt us. And that's why we have to guard our heart and keep our heart before the Lord and keep our heart tender and forgive those people because they don't know what they're doing many times. Sometimes they could be Christians, but they still have a certain level of blindness because they're not 
coming in, they haven't come into that level of maturity. It takes time to mature. It takes time to bear fruit in Christ and to be, even bear his image. And so here God is teaching us how to overcome those offenses. He, he's talking about offenses coming from the world in this particular instance. He says, but woe to the man by whom the offense cometh. In other words, God is the judge in anything. When we release things to God, God knows where to administer mercy. He knows where to administer grace. And he does know where to administer judgment. And I want to talk about that for a moment because we live in uh, a time and day where in 21st century Christendom, people a lot of times will speak false doctrine and tell you that God does not bring judgment. That is not true. God is a God of love, but he also is a God of judgment. You would not have a parent that loves their child, that holds their child, hugs their child, but would not also discipline their child and correct them if they see their behavior is wrong. Because God is just and he's holy, he must judge what is wrong equally as he rewards what is right. He is the perfect judge, he is the perfect parent, he's perfect and absolutely all of his ways. There's nothing left undone. There's no variableness in God the Father. There's nothing, no variableness in the, in the, in the Lord our God. No shadow of turning in anything in him. Uh huh. And so you have to understand that he must judge you even if you're his child, he must correct you. He must bring reproof to you. So if you are a Christian and you are bound by sexual immorality, he has to bring a correction to your life until he can set you free. What he's looking at is your heart and how you're responding to the sin, how you're responding to what you're, you feel trapped or bound by, or some cases just making your own decision to sin and do. Some people, I heard uh, one pastor say, he said, you say that you're weak, but God says that you're wicked. Our flesh has a nature of wickedness in it, and we have to be able to admit that. Some people will not own what they do that is wrong, and therefore they cannot change. And so if you want to make changes, you have to come to God in honesty and begin to work it out and say, Lord, this is where my heart is. There's some unclean things in my heart. There's some unforgiveness in my heart. I can't enter into heaven with unforgiveness in my heart. I can't enter into heaven with sexual unclean thoughts. I can't enter into heaven with revengeful, dark thoughts, jealousy, uh, envious, uh, covetousness. You can't enter into heaven with these things that are contrary to the light of his glory and his holiness and his power. So when you see it and you examine yourself, the Bible says, let every man examine himself in the book of James. And so when you examine your soul and you see what is in you, you know what is not bearing his image. Those things you present to him and you give to him and say, God, cleanse me of this. Forgive me of this. And when you ask him to forgive you of that, he washes away those sins and he begins to operate in such a way in your life where he begins to gently mold you and make you because of the convicting power of the Holy Spirit where you do not want to say things that are offensive or do things that are wrong anymore. You want to walk in the light of his spirit. And that's what makes the differentiation between being a Christian and not being a Christian. It's not because you have no sin. It's because the sin that you have, you repent of it and you ask God to cleanse you of it. So a lot of times people think when you're a Christian, you think that you're better or you think you're this or you're that. No, contrary. Everyone is at the foot of Calvary. The difference is whether or not you accept the sacrifice that has been given to you on Calvary. When you truly accept the sacrifice that's been given to you on Calvary, you receive the spirit of redemption, the spirit of being redeemed, because you don't just receive the word of God, but his words are spirit and they are life. In other words, there's a power or an energy in the word of God. The power that's in the word of God, the scripture talks about it in St. John, the first chapter. He says, to as many as received him, talking about Jesus Christ, who was the word of God, gave he them power, power to become the sons of God. So he gives us power to transform and bear the image of Jesus Christ. That power that we have been given that's in his word, the, the power is the power of the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
That's the presence of God that convicts you when you're praying and you're calling out to the Lord. That's the tangible presence of God that's in the realm where you are right now. That's the Holy Spirit that you're feeling that warmth across your face right now as you're listening to me, as you feel tears swelling up. Uh, oh, uh, come into your face. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the power of God. And that same power is the power of deliverance and the power of the spirit of the living God that has come to set you free. What is he setting you free from? The law of sin and death. There's a law of sinning and receiving death for the wages of your sin is death. And there's a law. There's a law of sin and death. And what sets you free from the law of sin and death is the law of the spirit, which is the power of God that is inside of his word, which is the Holy Spirit. And if you're listening to me, I simply want you to begin to pray and cry out to God even now and begin to talk to him and say, Lord Jesus, I need you. Heavenly Father, I need you. We, we were going to talk about the Godhead in another program about the Father, the Son, which is also the Word of God. That's in 1 John uh, 5 and 7 and 8. It talks about the, there are three that bear uh, record in heaven that hold the power of God's Word. And that is the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the three, which are one. And so the power of the Father is that he speaks. Speaks. And when he speaks, his word manifested in flesh is the person of Christ Jesus. So we can now identify with God and handle him and touch him and feel him and experience him through the scriptures as he lived his life in the flesh. We're touching Jesus. We're touching the Father. The Lord Jesus Christ says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because when he speaks, his word is, is power. His word was manifested through the person of Christ to speak in the earth around how great God is. I can't begin to tell you how great our God is. It's just beyond words sometimes. And so he manifested what he wanted to speak to us, humanity, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who now has individually become his only begotten son. And the power that is upon him, which is also inside of his word, is the power of the Holy Spirit. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I I am well pleased. And how can God the Father be well pleased in us when he looks in us? Like when he saw that coin come out of that fish's mouth, when he looks inside of us, he sees the image of Jesus in us, in our soul, because the Spirit of God is shaping that image on the inside of us. And when we speak, we have the currency of a Kevin that reflects the image of God. Amen. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I am a sinner, and I need a Savior. I need you, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I need you. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins, and they are many. I'm asking you to take away every unclean thought, every unclean feeling, everything that is contrary to you. God, take away every bad action. Maybe you smoke or you drink and you know that it's wrong. It's not good for your body. It's destroying your body. Lord, take that from me, that cursing. Take that from me because God is holy. I want to be clean. I want to be pure. I don't have any power to do it in myself, but you told me if I believe on you, you'll give me the power and that you love me. I receive you now, Lord Jesus, into my heart. I thank you for forgiving me of my sins and I receive the power of the baptism of the Holy Ghost right now in Jesus' name. If that's you, you're saved.